Yeah. Andrew, how are you? It's David Sam. I'm well. How are you? Do- hey, David, how are you doing, man? I'm doing well. Thanks. It's got to be a busy day for you. I'm very thankful that you are joining us because the article that you dropped uh, about what's happening with college sports tomorrow. I led nothing personal with it this morning, and I, but we wanted to talk in detail, more detail with you right now about it because I think people are underselling how epic this is that a bunch of guys have gotten together thinking they can replace the NCAA, but they only want to do it for football. And I'm not sure that there's a lot of focus on the fact that this announcement, so tell, please tell the audience about the announcement or what you discovered in this piece. Yeah, so there's a group that you know I first heard about during Super Bowl, um, led by Len Perna, who runs Turnkey, um, which basically recommends all the conference commissioners and other jobs around college sports. Um, and then also Brian Rolap it w- was involved. So um, Rolap's name is important because he's the number two at the NFL. If Roger Goodell were ever to retire, Rolap would be at the top of the list to possibly replace him. He's also the mastermind behind all their TV deals that add up to $110 billion. So, you know, that gets people's attention. Um, And so uh, they're working with presidents. You know, we spoke to the president of West Virginia, the president of Syracuse. They talked about how the current system is dead. Um, And so uh, the big thing that's going on that you know, in our reporting that, you know, I knew about, but kind of became even clearer are the lawsuits that the, uh, that the universities are facing uh, in terms of NIL, uh, when you go back, um, and the, the amount of money they could owe, uh, you know, there's likely going to be a settlement. Um, but, you know, a lot of people have talked about, you know, a word that starts with a B as in boy, as in billions. Um, and so, you know, if that happens, uh, then, you know, we know there's going to be a shakeup in college football, but how is it going to play out? And this group have a lot of influential uh, leaders in sports. Uh, they are trying to to uh, to put together a plan and have put a, together a plan and are continuing to work on a plan that they think would be the best way forward um, for all the FBS teams, uh, which are 130 teams uh, right now, plus 30, 130 plus teams. Yeah, you say best way forward and I say relegation. And that may be tomato, tomato, but we can debate relegation and promotion. But what their plan is, what some of the commissioners of the Power Five conferences have wanted, which is basically, we'll take a buy. And I don't mean a buy to the CFP. I mean a buy that we can never be relegated. We'll always be in the top 70. And then we'll let the lesser FBS schools fight it out in the eighth division. And we'll do promotion relegation from there. And that's an interesting way of putting a committee together and just saying, all right, Tony Petiti, you guys have the power and we're going to give you even more of it. And I'm wondering when in your reporting, how do you feel about relegation? Because in North America, we've never seen it. And I'm not sure with TV deals that it could ever actually happen. Where Where is your head on that? I think their plan that they have actually makes a lot of sense uh, when you're being realistic. Uh, you know, if you look at it, so the way it would set up is that there'd be a top division made up of eight division, eight divisions within it and 10 teams each. So that adds up to 80. Um, there'd be 70 teams, like you mentioned, that are permanent. And so you have the 68 that were in the former Power Five, counting the Pac-12, and then Notre Dame, and then probably SMU. Uh, and then the rest of the teams would be in the second division with 10 spots reserved for them in the top division and they'd be able to fight to get into that and then you get promoted and then if you were to finish um, at the bottom of the standings you'd move down um, which you know we look at European football creates a lot of excitement uh, for those teams I think I understand what you're saying it should be an even playing field but if you're Alabama Notre Dame or any of the top programs it's just not I don't think that's realistic to say okay even though you probably wouldn't ever be in jeopardy um you'd want that guaranteed. You couldn't take that chance. That's why, you know, this is patterned in some regards after MLS, um, which the way MLS ownership works is you own a percentage of the league. Um, you don't own a team, um, which uh, makes it so they work as one entity. And, and that's why this makes sense. Um, in MLS, 
what as a soccer person who who loves soccer, I mean, what hurts MLS is they don't have relegation and promotion because people spend so much money to get these teams and they don't want to take the chance like that happens in Europe. And you could spend a lot of money and then have a top uh, team or club uh, get relegated. So um, I hear your point, but I just think that if you're being realistic, um, you're never going to really get these top programs to agree to anything like that. My concern is that the teams that get relegated – the impact would be on non-football sports because there is a financial implication to being relegated. And if there's not, then it's not actually relegation. So I assume part of the plan but it, yeah. includes but it wouldn't be a loss an equal of money. Playing field. Yeah, but it wouldn't be equal. Like Alabama and Notre Dame in this plan would make more money than other schools. And they based it on a formula that they're putting together in terms of your ratings, in terms of a bunch of factors. And I think you have to have it that way because if, you, if they were going to work. I, and something that really needs to be pointed out is that the power right now and and the people who probably are going to make the decisions are the SEC um, with Greg Sankey, the Big Ten with Tony Petiti, and both of those men are the commissioners of those conferences, and then the networks, especially Fox and ESPN, because they have the power. Um, they have long-term deals for billions of dollars. And so as you go forward, they're the ones also with the best teams. So they could actually kind of do what they want. And they already have an alliance that they're looking at it, an advisory alliance, you know, where they're working together. Now, obviously that could lead to, and a lot of people pointed to the SEC uh, and the Big Ten kind of creating an AFC and NFC. I think the danger for that, in my opinion, is that you might kill the rest of college football. And do you really want to be the ones to do that? I don't know. That would be a little too greedy in my eyes. Um, and so uh, how do you go forward? How do you include everybody? Uh, and I understand what you're saying uh, in terms of the financial implications. I mean, obviously, that's something they're going to have to uh, figure out if you could go up or down. Um, but I also think, you know, football is different than other sports. There's You can't really have a Cinderella in football to go all the way and win a championship. It's just not realistic just to how the game is played the power, the strength, um, and the speed that the top players have as compared to the lower players. Uh, and so I, I don't think it's I, – I I think you you would create with this um, a system where there would be something to play for at every level and that interest throughout the sport for the whole year would be maintained. Now, the other problem, I think, with the plan, though, is the idea that it would create so much more – television value that they get so much more money um i don't know i don't see that maybe it, i do think it's a better plan than the hodgepodge kind of that we have now with all the different conferences and the games <clears> at different times um but i don't know if you're going from three million people watching to nine million people watching i don't see that 3x difference um because i just think there's only so many great matchups even right. if you have a more a better system super leagues have been talked about for a long time they tried one in epl and it lasted about an hour and a half, I believe, is shorter than than even this show for all the people <laughs> who miss Rich so badly. Uh, that's how long the Super League lasted over in the EPL. The the in baseball they tried that. George Steinbrenner, I mean Andrew, we've talked. Steinbrenner, the Yankees and Red Sox have often said, "Why would we give revenue sharing to low revenue teams? We don't want to share." And our answer was fine. Then don't play us. Just keep playing yourselves on ESPN Sunday night and do that 160 <laughs> times. And sometimes, like when we beat him in the World Series, he would say, we'd prefer to do that. And the problem with the college plan, as I read it and thought about it, since reading your great article on The Athletic that everyone should go to and read in great detail about this group of people in college sports tomorrow really creating a Super League, the more I thought about it, Andrew, and, I, and I'm trying to work through an answer for, the, for me and the audience, is I don't understand how the worst team of the 70 could be worse than the best team of the 10, and yet they're protected. So I'm not talking Alabama or Notre Dame. I'm talking about the lower echelon of the 70 who gets brought into the protected zone who could in theory be worse teams than the bottom 10. No, that, that's that's a fair point. Um, but I guess you have to have a cutoff at some place. And also, I just think you have to have buy in, right? Because you do have this legacy um, situation. You know, I covered baseball for a long time. You were in baseball for a long time. So we kind of understand the 
the financials. Now you, you're telling from the Mar Marlins point of view and having covered the Yankees, having covered the Mets, you know, I understand their point of view as well. Like if you look at what's happening in regional sports networks in the future. So around the country, there's a lot of uh, teams that they're because of cables and the unbundling people and cutting the cord that people are doing uh, the cable deals are in question, but I don't think the, you know, so the major league baseball ideally would love to, pool all the rights together and sell them as one entity. But teams like the Yankees are not going to want to do that because they're way more popular. They have successful cable networks still, and they're making way more money. And so they don't feel the need to do that. That's why the NFL structure works because everyone, even though, you know, in recent years with the Jerry Jones, et cetera, it's changed a little bit, but overall everyone gets an equal a piece of the pie, um, which works in the NFL. It's also the structure of the, you know, the season and, and a lot of factors. And so, um, what you know, this group is the, called College Sports Tomorrow is trying to do is figure out well, how to best do that. But you do have to be realistic. It's not a you can't just be idealistic uh, because there is you know pre-existing uh, universities and there's pre-existing value. Um, but yeah, your point is well taken um, in terms of if you're talking about that those final you know, ten to fifteen teams in that seventy, why are they protected and team seventy one is not protected? Um, I guess the argument would be made that team seventy one. And, you know, 71 through 80, they would be in that first group uh, and they can maintain and, and, and stay in there um, as long as uh, they're successful. Um, but uh, yeah, but that but well, that's they what can't causes... actually because they could be more successful than the bottom of the 70 and still one of them would get relegated because the top 70 are protected. If you look at the rankings, it's possible that team 71 through 80 would be ranked between 50 and 60. And the teams between 60 and 70 should be ranked between 70 and 80, but they'd be protected. Now, that's a scenario well, that's unlikely, but it's not impossible. But it's not even what yeah. I took the most umbrage with, Andrew. Why did they call it? Did they answer this question? Maybe Blitzer did. Why it's called college sports tomorrow? <laughs> Why isn't it called college football tomorrow? Yeah, I mean, I well, they, like we didn't get into this fully because you can't get into every um, point in a story, but... Um, they're tackling football for, I think we did mention it actually. They're tackling football first and then they'll move to the other sports. And their feeling is, is that you got to get football right. It's the most, it's the biggest revenue driver. And then you can move on to the other sports. Um, and they think that this would fuel being able to support everything because it gets really thorny. We didn't fully even get into title nine and the lawsuits that could come from that. Um, you know, which are, which are other factors um, when you really get deep into the stuff and trying to figure out everything um, and the, you know, and to be equitable uh, for non-revenue um, sports uh, creating sports. Uh, and so, yeah, they're starting with football, um, but it's not an end point, but I do think when you look at football and then basketball and you compare it to the other, those other sports, the rest of the sports, um, in terms of their financials um, and their popularity, especially on TV, it's different than, um, you know, than other competitions. Well, when you do, when they, when they start the college basketball tomorrow, it's going to be different conferences at the table. I don't think that Tony Petiti, who, of course, you know, I worked with for so many years in baseball, I yep. think it's sort of a different story. Wouldn't ACC, I may be wrong here, Chris, but... Wouldn't it be different conferences at the table when they start dealing with basketball versus ba versus uh, football? Well, the ACC would be more prominently involved, right, Andrew? But it's still the Big Ten. But you see, the, the thing I would say is that the way, and this is why, like, the conference commissioners have the most power, is that um, what they're doing with college sports tomorrow is taking out, it's not lumping Alabama and Vanderbilt together. Right, which are different, even though they're both in the SEC. Alabama is a perennial national championship contender, one of the biggest brands, popular for people around the country to watch. Vanderbilt's an amazing university, hasn't been as good at football, but they're in the same. So when Greg Sankey represents them, he's representing them all. So in your scenario, when you're looking at if they were to do college basketball tomorrow, then you would take North Carolina and Duke out um, and – you know, who, you know, whoever the bottom feeders of the ACC are wouldn't be considered as valuable or, you know, treated in the same way as UNC and Duke, which, you know, I would guess are, if not the two most valuable programs, when you look at it from a TV um, 
uh, point of view um, than at least in the top five uh, of those. And so uh, that's how like, the, you know, that's they're also feeling is that they're not they're not directly involved. Like the other issue is like when you talk about um, the commissioners and you know, are they going to want to make a system where there's no SEC and then they don't have they're not heading up football? I doubt it. Right. Um, and so, like, how do you get to that? Um, I think if you're starting from scratch, what college sports tomorrow lays out um, makes a lot of sense. The problem is you're not starting from scratch. There's contracts that exist. There are teams with value uh, that that are way more than other teams. And so it gets complicated. And the other big thing is the union aspect of it. You know, this is this system that they're creating or trying to create um, goes on the assumption that the players association, uh, there is a players association in college sports and that you would negotiate with them, which gets around anti antitrust issues that are just never going to go away until they have a plan uh, because there's different rules in different states and it's very complicated. Um, and so that's one thing that is like I, I would say this like our story to me and this is like kind of the thing that we were talking about like and hopefully it is and I'm not saying it is or isn't but this is going to be an issue that people college football fans and college athletic fans have to understand that is going to be with the sport over the next decade and hopefully this is sort of a primer of like a definitive article of like what's ahead and not necessarily that this will happen but I do think some of these ideas could survive um I don't know if this group will win out but um but I, I do think that this is this is happening. It's just how and when and timetables that we don't know. But but all this stuff in there, it's it's going to happen. Maybe not the um, Super League, uh, but there is going to be a change in terms of how players are compensated, which we've already seen, but more official. And there's going to be decisions that have to be made. And I do think that the university presidents from West Virginia, from Syracuse, do have a very good point to say you want to be out, out in front of the issue to try to create a system that works. Um, now, the counterpoint is West Virginia and Syracuse, you may want to be in front of it, but it's going to be Alabama, Michigan, Notre Dame who are going to be really deciding. Yeah, Andrew, this is why Nick Saban retired, right? He didn't want to deal with all this. Yeah, I think in part, yeah, and I think, um, you know, look, I, I think there's a lot of factions involved in this. Jim but, Harbaugh, too, back in the NFL. Like, why would they want to deal with well, that? He was also in trouble, to be fair. Maybe. Every other day. Maybe. But but there is something to that, right? Well, 100%. Like, the system right now is too unwieldy. Um, you know, not for players. Like, you know, I think I would argue that if a coach can change and coach the next year, I don't see why a player or student athlete – can't leave and then go play someplace else. That makes sense. Like I don't, right. if you're really looking at it from the athlete point of view, not from a selfish fan point of view and who we want to root for. And we want our players on our team as if, you know, it is professional sports and it is in somewhat kind of well, like professional not, sports. Non-athlete so students can change colleges and transfer as exactly. much as they want. So yeah, exactly. So why should they be different? So that's why, you know, you need something to, to figure out a system though, um, where, um, where it makes sense for, for everybody. Um, and so right now it doesn't, like, it's just the wild West. And, you know, this is a, a lot of, you know, things are changing, but in these court, the, the other big thing is these court cases that are coming up, um, and, you know, in our reporting, you know, I, I understood it before, but I really understood it even more of what could happen, um, if they owe all this money, you know, that is what is going to, you know, put a big monkey wrench into everything where solutions are going to have to be, um, decided and come up and, you know, and, 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 you know, and Andrew, made. it's not a guarantee also that they're going to be unionized. We said that, but I want to make sure that we're clear while Dartmouth had the right to, to form a union, there's an appeal that will be heard before the NLRB and it's going to be years. So I, I, I want to make sure that people are clear that this sort of super league concept college sports tomorrow, tomorrow is the operative word. And you can read more about it on the athletic. We've been speaking to Andrew Marchand who's digging deep in a story that you're going to get to write about this. I would assume you're looking at the next five to eight years. So I hope you have a long-term deal with The Athletic because I don't for any reason believe that the solution that we're reading about now actually works on every level. So I think they're going to have to do more work, which means you're going to get to write more columns that are fascinating. I have a 10-year contract. Perfect. That sounds about like right it. to me, uh, especially like because <laughs> the president of West Virginia is quoted in your article as saying it's an existential crisis. I like when people exactly. drop existential crisis because they got to figure out how to deal with relegation and promotion. 
Yeah, nobody should have a 10-year contract, and I don't either, just to, to officially. Oh, I thought we were breaking news. I just <laughs> got a text from Jason Stark, who's watching the show, saying, 10 years for Andy? What is going on here? Uh, Do you want us to edit that yeah. out? Let's just make it seven years. There you go. We're going to take care go. of this issue in seven years. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. The Athletic Senior Writer. If you don't have a subscription to The Athletic, you should. Unbelievable reporting on all sorts of different sports. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, guys. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku Channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.